Um, I'm moving into notes 13. Um, and I'm actually on the second page. I should have attached the first page, which shows that, that 3D survey layout to uh, the, end the end of number 12. But I didn't. So um, this is a, uh, um, a lecture that is meant to bring anybody up to speed who is unfamiliar with um, the real fundamentals of, of seismic surveying. So uh, you may find it useful. It may be completely um, boring repetition. And I, I want to start out with the, uh, the fundamental, which we'll, we'll get back to. I'll actually derive this a little bit later from uh, you know, Newton's laws. But um, everything that, that we do is according to, in, in this class, uh, in the second half of this class especially, it's according to this simple uh, scalar acoustic wave equation. All right, So we have the Laplacian of the uh, pressure field. And uh, notice I'm not saying you know, whether we're looking at 1D, 2D, or 3D geometry here. It could be any of those. And uh, so these are the Laplacian, of course, is second order spatial derivatives. Uh, in each direction, and that's equal to the uh, those 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 the sum of all those derivatives is equal to one over the wave propagation velocity squared, and and we're going to be dealing with the uh, it, since it's acoustic we're going to be dealing with the uh, the P wave velocity all right uh, times the second time derivative of the pressure field okay so the pressure field really can have um, uh, it really has uh, four dimensions. Uh, the pressure field varies in x, it varies in y, it varies in z, and it also varies in time. And that's how you get waves. So this this e equating of the of the spatial derivatives to the uh, time derivative. Uh, through the velocity is is really the the essence of the of the wave equation, and I'm in this class I'm not much going to mention the further complications brought in by having a uh, or considering a, um, uh, a a vector wave equation, which would give you then p waves and s waves and surface waves and all that. Okay, we're just dealing with uh, P wave reflections, uh, and this is a very good model, of course, for marine seismic reflection data, and it's a pretty lousy model for um, for land seismic reflection data, especially shallow reflection data that tends to have a lot of influence by the surface waves. But if you can get rid of the surface waves using any of the many filtering techniques that we have talked about and are going to talk about. If you can get rid of the surface waves or ameliorate them when you when you collect the data, uh, there's lots of techniques for that. Then um, the reflections that you have can still be explained by this um, acoustic wave equation, and the the velocity that uh, you would use is the simple P wave velocity, which is the same one. It's the same P wave velocity whether you're in in fluids or or in um, um, uh, or on land. Uh, you know, in, in you know chunky, dry alluvium, um, it's still the same P wave velocity. Um, kind of the prototype, okay, for what we're considering are marine surveys, especially uh, like the chirp surveys, where we're never looking very far below the muddy lake bottom, and and so you know we can have useful data sets like Amy Isis's data set from Pyramid Lake. Uh, or the data sets that Gretchen's looking at from um, uh, the bottom of Lake Tahoe, where the the velocity is everywhere, pretty much the velocity of water, uh, and uh, uh, it's just the um, and, and everything is propagating according to this acoustic wave equation. The mud at the bottom of the lake, which is showing the stratigraphy we're interested in and the faults that we're interested in, is is still so fluid. It's got so much water in it. That uh, the acoustic wave equation is almost perfect. Uh, you know, the, the shear modulus is, is extremely small. Okay, so so we have a second order uh, wave equation, 
I mean, I mean, second order is partly what makes it a wave equation. And this second order equation has a, uh, a solution, which is, again, one of these Euler uh, exponentials. Okay? Um, and uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's E with an imaginary exponent. And, and it's not, notice that there's a sine and a cosine in the exponent. That, that has to do with the geometry of the wave propagation direction, uh, which is uh, called the ray direction. Um, or, or you could also consider it to be the geometry of the wave front. You know, here I'm representing it in a 2D section uh, in x and z. Okay, so so you know we still have um, uh, you know this is this is uh, very much uh, very much like uh, uh, e to the i omega t, which we've looked at a lot in our considering of one-dimensional seismograms. But here we see that our uh, our the sines and cosines that we get out of the uh, imaginary exponential or the imaginary exponent, um, these are uh, these are affected by other geometric sines and cosines that are buried within them. Okay, so the wave nature of the data, you know, the sine and cosine nature of the solution is still hidden within this imaginary exponent to e, uh, and and this is really just a the sine theta times x plus cosine theta times z is really just expressing the, the ray direction, okay? the two components of the ray direction. Um, and the relation to time is here in, in omega over v. Okay? So this is a function of, um, of omega, x, and z. And, and it will, at constant omega, it solves that acoustic wave equation. Uh, and this is like a, a monotonic wave. Um, that's propagating at this angle theta. Okay, um, so we have a uh, 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 an assumption that we'll use uh, that uh, we can uh, uh, as well that we can use optical rays. Okay, which basically means that we're we're saying that our frequency is effective effectively infinitely high. Okay. And we, uh, um, of course, that's a that's a pretty lousy assumption. You know, our 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 data are very limited in their frequency, especially their high frequency, um, and they're very noisy at the higher frequencies. Um, so we can only use this assumption so far, uh, but it's it's really what allows us to um, easily examine these you know geometric sines and cosines. Uh, and and uh, track the geometry of the ray and where the wave is propagating, because that's what we're 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 going to try to get to is you know how deep did this reflection come from? Where did it come from? What's the dip of the structure that it came from? So it's all in the geometry of the ray, okay? And then if we got to if, if we got to consider all right, now how accurately do we know that geometry? That's when we got to bring back the finite frequency omega, and um, and take it out of the optical ray uh, uh, realm. But with optical rays, you get all these convenient equations that you probably already know about. You get Snell's law. You get uh, you know equal angle of reflection and uh, transmission. You get reflection coefficients that are pretty pretty easy to calculate. Um, your resolution is infinite, okay? But uh, uh, you know you you can deal with the resolution differently and consider the finite frequency separately. You know, without disturbing your your computation of the geometry through Snell's law. So um, here's a couple of diagrams that uh, give you the the sort of automatic industry assumption. Um, you know, and, and the whole um, seismic imaging enterprise. You know, probably uh, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars per year now. Um, uh, just for I don't know maybe a hundred billion dollars worldwide each year for for seismic imaging. Okay, it's a lot of money. Uh, not nearly as much money as being invested in drilling these days. Okay, um, so again, um, you know our exploration techniques are are cheaper than the uh, than drilling. Um, and and these techniques are all built on this this. Assumption of lateral homogeneity. If you 
if you take your velocity field, right, and the velocity is going to vary in x, y, and z, right, with z being depth, uh, and if you if you um, uh, if you differentiate it with uh, your velocity field with x, um, you get zero. If you differentiate the velocity field with y, or you have two D data, you get zero. Okay, that means lateral homogeneity. I'm not necessarily saying, and, and there's you know good traditional techniques for dealing with velocities that vary with depth, and they can vary with depth pretty wildly, and and we're going to be uh, accurate enough. Um, but what the whole you know all this jargon you've heard about stacking, migration, um, uh, velocity analysis, NMO, normal move out, uh, the the whole concept of midpoints and depth points, that's all built around this assumption of lateral homogeneity. Now, of course, in the last 25 years, industry has gone way beyond that, but you still see the vestiges of that assumption in, in everything that happens. Okay? And everything that's kind of built on top of this assumption that, you know, that allows you to consider lateral homo uh, homogeneity, or allows you to consider lateral heterogeneity, at least at one time, every one of those developments was patented by somebody, okay, and and uh, licensed by somebody, and uh, and had a had a trade had a had a trademark name, okay. So so that's you know we got to start with this lateral homogeneity, and then we can go from there, all right. And and we'll do the same thing. We'll start with lateral homogeneity. In fact, we'll start with with total homogeneity, and then we'll. Um, uh, pretty quickly, we'll be able to go up to lateral homogeneity, and um, and, and any uh, velocity variation in uh, in z, and then we'll uh, we'll start considering. All right, what if we what if we if dv dx is not zero? Okay, what if that happens? And and even in this class, we'll be able to to do some things about that. Okay, so given lateral homogeneity. Um, we have uh, uh, on the bottom is a cross section, okay. So you uh, let's see if I can get to it without flipping the next page. We have uh, the and, and you know you'll have to get used to these axes. Um, I'm I'm drawing them all the time. This is this is a cross section because the vertical axis is labeled with z, depth increasing down, and the horizontal axis is labeled with with x up above. So maybe I should uh, shrink that a little bit. Yeah, up above, we've got um, um, we've got a a, a a time section, not a cross section, but a time section. And we know it's a time section because <coughs> the uh, the time axis is or the vertical axis is labeled with t. Uh, and get this, it still points down because we're considering reflections. Okay. The idea is that the greater the travel time, the greater the depth, right? So it makes just as much sense to make our time increase downward as it make as it does to make our depth increase downwards. Okay. Uh, our horizontal axis is still x. All right. So I have uh, a source of seismic waves, which is this red star, and I have this upside down triangle, which is the receiver, the geophone. And I, I have at some depth z naught, I have a, uh, uh, a reflector, which uh, let me just say now for lateral homogeneity, it's perfectly flat. Okay. Um, so um, we, uh, we let loose the source, and a wave propagates down to the depth point, the midpoint at the reflector, at the flat reflector, and bounces up again uh, you know, through the uh, reflection coefficient. Some of the energy bounces back to the receiver, and the path is this nice even triangle. Okay, and the the distance between the source and the receiver on the surface is this capital X, or X with uh, serifs, if you like, uh, that uh, that that I'll also call the offset. That's the distance between the source and the receiver. Okay, so we want to write an equation for the travel time. All right. And I've already said, you know, I have constant at least where this reflection is propagating. I mean, maybe the maybe the velocity changes below z uh, at greater than z naught. 
but at, at least I'll consider for the moment that I have constant velocity above the depth z naught, okay? And that velocity is v. All right. So you write an equation for the travel time. It's t squared is equal to uh, two terms, the sum of two terms, and one is two z naught over v all squared plus the second term, which is uh, the offset big X over V uh, uh, with the ratio squared. Okay. So uh, one thing we, uh, we do is we consider, all right, you know, the, at, at 0x, okay, you put the source and the receiver together, right? And you have X equals big X equals 0. Okay. <clears throat> and, and notice that this is uh, big X now, not little x. Okay, that's labeling the, the time section horizontal axis. All right, and at big X equals zero, we're on the time axis here. And this, um, you know, if if we take this travel time equation and make big X equals zero, then all we've got left is is uh, uh, two z naught over v all squared. Okay, so we'll call that tau. And you can see that the the time at zero offset it depends only on the depth and the velocity, right? As it should. Okay, so uh, and if we have the time there, we can at zero offset we can calculate the velocity. You know, under this lateral homogeneity assumption, if we have <coughs> the time and we know the velocity, we can have the depth. All right. So uh, this tau here, Greek letter capital Greek, that's a small Greek letter tau, I think, um, uh, is is really the depth dependent uh, term, and the uh, so tau squared is there. And then uh, the offset dependent term has capital X squared over V squared. And that's equal to the, the total you know, two-way reflection travel time squared. Um, now, the, the, what we, uh, th this, this, and you can see that this equation is a hyperbola, right? As, uh, as capital X gets very large, dt dx becomes uh, equal to, uh, to 1 over V. And in fact, it's... Uh, it's it's actually asymptotic to that uh, uh, to that line, you know, going all the way back to the origin, zero times zero uh, big X. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a, hy a hyperbola. So just like it has this linear asymptote, it's flat at the top. Okay, now this uh, hyperbolic shape has a uh, has a jargon name called the uh, the normal move out. The move out is as you go from trace to trace, from distance to distance. <clears throat> you know, because you record a, a different uh, seismogram at every distance, at, at different distances from the fault. Okay, so that what we have here is a lot of seismograms, and we're tracking the the reflection arrival time across all the seismograms. So the um, you know this shape that starts up that starts flat and then curves into the asymptote of one over v. That's called NMO, normal move out. And one of the things that we're that we're used to doing, uh, you know, if we've done any stacking, any of this uh, normal, um, uh, simple <coughs> in industry standard processing from 30 years ago, what we do is we we take out the normal move out. We we want to uh, leave the depth dependent term and take out the x dependent term. Okay, so we actually. Uh, and, and you can see you can do that. You know at every trace, you know its distance, the distance of that trace, the big X from the source. And if you know the velocity, then you can remove this big X squared over V squared. Okay, And, and you'll just have the time tau uh, left. And so that would take this, this, line, this uh, curve and flatten it uh, to, all be, to, to, to be all the same at the time tau. Okay, that's the that's the process of normal move out correction, and since it depends on velocity, we actually turn that into a uh, an analysis tool. In in my um, applied geophysics course, we turn it into an analysis tool, and we use uh, this this objective of flattening the the normal move out as a way of getting the velocity. Right? I mean, how can you correct the normal move out without knowing the velocity? Well, you just try it a bunch of times until you get the velocity right. Okay, at a, you try it through a whole range of velocities. Okay, so that's that's classic. And now uh, the problem we're going to grapple with explicitly in this half of the class is what if the reflector dips? Okay, 
So we don't have lateral homogeneity anymore. All right, um, and the NMO correction is going to be wrong. The stack is going to be wrong. Um, all of that is um, uh, is subject to uh, problems. Okay. So uh, again, here I've got the cross section down below and the time section up above. <clears throat> there's a uh, um, uh, there's a dip angle, right? We're in a two D world here, so we're at at uh, the true dip. Uh, the dip angle, the true dip is alpha, and we still have um, a source and receiver separated by you know the same x or range of, of big x's. Okay. One thing we'll keep track of here is is all right. You know this this reflection daylight somewhere, uh, and uh, and our experiment is 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 located. Um, you know, somewhere away from that, okay, above it. So uh, we have a midpoint, you know, the average location of the source and the receiver, and that midpoint is, you know, at some distance from where the reflection daylights, and all those things are along the, the x-axis, okay. And as you can see, for equal angle of incidence and reflection, I'm kind of tracing along the normal to the surface now for this, uh, about, looks like about 45 degree dipping um, uh, reflector, okay, that the reflection point is no longer under the midpoint. Okay, the, in, in this case, with a 45 degree dip, the reflection point is, you know, miles from the midpoint. Okay, so that's uh, one problem. If we assume that the depth points are at the midpoint, then we're, you know, we're not going to be able to deal very well with lateral uh, homogeneity. And actually here, I've got a definition of migration. Okay, what migration does is it um, uh, it takes the reflection. You know, once we do stacking, we're assuming lateral homogeneity. So the the uh, uh, the reflection point, uh, the depth point, is right under the midpoint. Okay, precisely under the midpoint. And what migration does is it takes that assumed. Um, uh, Depth point that assumed uh, reflection point. Uh, it takes it. It migrates it from the assumed um, position under the midpoint to its true position. Okay, that's what migration does. It it migrates it up the dipping reflector to the true position. Um, and we'll we'll see a lot of a lot of the aspects of that. Okay, now. Uh, uh, one of the things that we, uh, you know, and, and again, we're going to assume our velocity, right? So it was pretty easy here uh, with lateral homogeneity, right? We, uh, we have time, okay? Uh, we have big X. Um, we have the velocity. So the only thing that we didn't know was the depth, okay? And we can calculate that very easily with this, you know, with this one experiment. Actually, with any single trace, you know, under the assumption of lateral homogeneity, we can get the depth. You know, one trace in any offset. We know what the offset is. We know what the time of the arrival is. We know the velocity. We can get z naught. Okay, out of that equation. All right. Here we don't just have a depth. We have a we have a dip. All right. And and so I I write the uh, the move out equation. And now it's no longer normal move out. Okay. And the depth dependent part now depends on uh, and actually, I, I put the daylight. I should have put the daylighted part. Uh, uh, the daylight is at zero, uh, is at little x equals zero, which is where the reflector daylights. Okay, so you trace up the dip of that, and it's a constant dip here in this equation. You trace up there, and m is the is essentially the distance uh, from the the from where the reflect reflection uh, daylights. Okay, so the the depth dependent part becomes this two m times the sine of the dip over the velocity, and then I'll take all that squared, and the distance um, uh, uh, part becomes um, and actually I should use that should be capital X right there. That shouldn't be small x. That should be that capital X with serifs. Okay, it's the offset times the cosine of the dip uh, divided by the velocity. So you can see that the the uh, the dip has affected both the depth calculation as it should, 
and the uh, velocity and the uh, the move out calculation, right? And and the move out uh, the the uh, the part you know for non-zero capital X you know right here. <clears throat> this means that it becomes um, it becomes asymptotic at a different apparent velocity. dt over dx, you know, for large capital X out here, is going to be cosine alpha over v. Okay, so uh, really, you know, we're looking at a at at one over an apparent velocity, one over v a. Okay, which is equal to uh, 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 v a is equal to v over uh, cosine alpha. Uh, maybe I should I should write that. Um, so both of those x's, x small x's in the equation are big x's. That's what you mean. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, right. That's an alpha. That's an alpha. But that's big x. Okay. And then we here we have the the part that depends on the depth, right? Mm -hmm. And and that x there, you know, this is just simplifying the equation. Um, you know, is x over v times cosine alpha, okay? And so let me uh, let me write that um, write that down. Um, oh yeah, I don't need uh, don't need that. So um, uh, what we've got here is. Um, is uh, v sub a is equal to um, uh, v over uh, cosine al cosine alpha. Okay. Um, and then uh, you know dt dx is uh, uh, and this just gets plugged into uh, uh, dt over dx. Is uh, is equal to uh, <coughs> is equal to uh, one over uh, v sub a. Okay, so that's that's the um, um, uh, that's where this apparent velocity comes in. That it's uh, uh, the 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 hyperbola is now asymptotic to. Um, uh, the hyperbola is asymptotic to this apparent velocity instead of being asymptotic to the asymptotic to the real velocity, and the this apparent velocity depend VA depends on the dip, right? Because alpha is the dip. So um, let me ask you a question um, uh, just to wake you up: um, uh, Is the is the apparent velocity the same as uh, greater? You know, given non-zero dip. Is the apparent velocity the same as the real velocity? Is it is it um, uh, less than the apparent less than the real velocity, or is the apparent velocity greater than the real velocity? Well, it won't appear smaller than the actually. Uh, well, the yeah, the apparent velocity is how it appears, right? Okay, so so I'm not I'm not I'm not talking about the slope. I'm talking about the uh, the velocity. Okay, so um, um, yeah, v a is equal to v over the true velocity v over cosine of the dip alpha or a. So so you know is is v a greater than v equal to v or less than v for non-zero alpha. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It actually doesn't doesn't matter which way the dip is either. You know whether the dip's uh, to the east or to the west here, to the right or to the left. Um, you know the cosine is always uh, is always um, less than one, right? So um, uh, so so that increases the the apparent velocity. So you can see, I, I I drew the in the in the time section here, I I actually drew the uh, um, uh, I, I actually drew the 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 slope as uh, as shallower, okay, um, because I wanted the uh, 
um, I drew the slope as shallower because that's a that's a higher apparent velocity. It's a non-zero dip. And you can see that the the you know you reduce it to zero dip and it's it's just as it was on the page before. Okay, so you know the the problem is here now we have two unknowns. We don't you know when we do the experiment we don't know what we know where m is, but we don't know how far m is from the where the reflection daylights because we don't know where the reflector daylights, right? So m is an is an unknown. Uh, you know, let's look at this whole equation here. M is an unknown. We don't know the dip either. Alpha is an unknown. Okay, and um, uh, and and uh, uh, x that's big X. We know that, but okay, alpha we don't know, and we're assuming we know v. All right, so we got two unknowns. Right, we're assuming we know t. We got this this one equation here, but we got two unknowns. So how do we how do we uh, how do we solve it? We we uh, we we need two equations. So uh, all we have to do is do two different experiments at two different m's, okay? Or or two different x's. That that works too, okay? So we need two times two equations, and then we can solve for both m and alpha. Uh, and 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 so this is you know because of you've learned where the uh, the diminishing returns one over square root of big N uh, factor. Okay, you've learned about that, and now, um, um, and now uh, this is uh, this is why we don't do record just two traces. You know, even though theoretically that would get us, you know, under this optical rays here, that would get us the dip. It would get us the uh, it would get us the uh, uh, the the depth. Okay, or, or where the daylight, where where it uh, where the reflector daylights. Okay. <clears throat> Um, you know, with just two traces, we get it. But because of the diminishing returns with, and and the fact that our data is noisy, okay, you know, I'm recording 48 traces. You know, trying to see this reflection on 48. You know, with 48 equations instead of just two, okay, and then get them all to uh, come into accord, right? Uh, um, uh, or or you know, these days, uh, you know, 20,000 traces. You know, trying to image one depth point. Okay, um, and and there's a lot of there's a lot of other reasons for multiple traces too, but this is this is one of them. We got to have more than one ray, more than one experiment, um, to get both the dip and the uh, the depth of the of the reflector. Okay, now I want to go into a, a little case history here um, that I did uh, 20 years ago. Um, and and uh, uh, it has to do with um, taking a look at at some uh, uh, seismic data recorded by the National Science Foundation and Cornell uh, in Southern California in the Mojave Desert, and uh, they were looking at a uh, pretty important uh, place on the uh, um, uh, in the California fault system. The Garlock is a left lateral strike slip fault, and it's uh, striking northeast. Whereas you know most of the faults in California are right lateral strike slip and they strike to the northwest. Okay, so this is a, a, a weird anomaly. And here's uh, some representatives. Actually, a number of these faults broke in uh, uh, in 1992, a little more than 20 years ago, in in uh, June '92, um, in the uh, the in in the Landers uh, earthquake sequence. Um, so those are the San Andreas parallel faults, and they're they're mostly right lateral. And uh, here we have a uh, uh, an opposing, uh, you know, in, in a way, an antithetic fault, uh, still strike slip, um, but it's left lateral. So you and and at this place called uh, Cantile Valley, it takes a a left step. So you have a left step in a um, in a left lateral fault. And that gives you trans tension. Okay, so there's a basin there, and uh, yeah, these are uh, gravity contours. Okay, so um, uh, we go from, let's see, um, 
we go from minus, uh, let's see, 40, 30, 20, 10, 100. Yeah, uh, these are uh, uh, 10 milligal contour intervals. So one, two, three. You know, this, this basin has almost 30 uh, milligals of, uh, of gravity, uh, gravity low, which means that there's a lot of basin fill there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and it's in this, you know, narrow... Um, narrow uh, valley that uh, that that um, occupies the uh, the step over um, if we go uh, let's see oh I was yeah okay I was gonna zoom in all right so let's zoom in okay if we go in a bit closer you can see that uh, the nice uh, you know coherent <coughs> <clears throat> the nice coherent, uh, um, you know, branches of the of the Garlock fault system. You know, they break up and and they they uh, uh, they form these uh, uh, you know horsetail patterns uh, that are kind of intersecting uh, that you might expect from a uh, you know in a transtensional pull apart basin. And here are some uh, uh, these uh, dark circled pluses are are uh, wells that uh, that hit uh, basement and you see this well is at uh, f uh, almost 1500 meters before it hit basement and then you cross over the southwest branch of the fault um, you know and outside the uh, the basin and uh, you know we had um, uh, wells that uh, they didn't quite hit basement but um, uh, they might have hit basement uh, oh no wait a minute it might be the other way around um, the closed ones, uh, the dark ones, did not hit basement. So this this one went 1,500 meters without hitting basement, and these wells uh, down here, they went only 100 or 180 meters, and they hit basement. Okay, which is mainly uh, granitic and metamorphic in this area. So pretty easy to uh, uh, to identify. Um, okay, so um, uh, and you can see this, you know, complex uh, fault system which which now, uh, um, uh, you know, now now has been much better studied than it, at uh, uh, at than at this time. Um, so this uh, this seismic line comes up to the north and almost gets to the north side of the basin, um, and before uh, uh, before it stops. Okay, so not quite. All right, so let's let's model what the what the data look like, okay? And and uh, uh, let's see, I should probably zoom out again. Okay, so all right, here's uh, here's a cross section, and I'm showing how velocity varies in that cross section, okay? Um, and these vibrator points are. Um, hundred meters apart, so um, 230 to 400, that's like 17 uh, kilometers then. Okay, so the basin is uh, five kilometers wide and, um, you know, maybe uh, a few kilometers deep. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one section here. There are, uh, there are reflectors down, down deep. Let's see, what's the maximum depth there? Ten kilometers. Okay, there's reflectors down deep. There's some reflectors that are in the basement that are relatively shallow. Okay, in in the basin proper, since it's along the active Garlock fault, uh, you know I didn't necessarily include any any interfaces in there. You know it's filled pretty fast. It's pretty narrow, filled pretty fast. Okay, so if we put the uh, the source for uh, for the seismic survey over here, we have a 10 kilometer array. Of receivers of 90, uh, 96 uh, receivers that goes south, right? So, and here's the uh, uh, the seismic record from that, the shot gather. Uh, time increases down, okay, um, but offset here, as you can see, is increasing to the left. I'm just emulating what the what that survey actually did. Okay, so the uh, the source is up here. You know, and 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 actually, this this direct wave coming uh, coming from the source is uh, 
um, is actually 400 meters off the, the right hand edge here, but it comes to zero time right there. And, and you can see the, um, the direct wave in the upper uh, lower velocity basement. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a reflection from, from this first interface here, which you can see is this hyperbola here. And uh, there are, let's see, this, is ex this one down here is exactly twice the time, so that's the multiple reflection. Okay. Um, no, it's not at twice the time because it's asymptotic to the same velocity. It must be uh, from a deeper reflector, just have it come out at twice the time at zero offset. And there's other reflections in here, you know, like from down here at uh, uh, that must be uh, seven kilometers or so. Okay, so so we have hyperbolic reflections that are uh, that are in here at um, at various uh, uh, you know. The time at, at zero offset, which is right over here, you know, at the flat part of the hyperbola, is that uh, is that, that's tau, and uh, you know, then we see this nor very nice normal move out uh, through the homogeneous, you know, laterally. Actually, this is not perfectly homogeneous; it's laterally homogeneous, right? And the one on the right is the laterally heterogeneous part. Okay, they're they're not homogeneous; they're laterally homogeneous. Okay, and here's a refraction from the. Uh, the bottom from this uh, reflector here, which is at a higher velocity, uh, that is finally outrunning. You know, at, at like nine kilometers offset, it's finally outrunning the uh, uh, the first arrival. Okay, now all we do is we move the whole experiment up by seven kilometers, and uh, so six six or so kilometers. So, so the source is here; it's right on the edge of the basin, and and now. The uh, the array the forty H, the ninety six channels are extending across the basin and then across the southwest branch of the fault and into this higher velocity terrain here so the uh, the whole thing is laterally heterogeneous and look at how the um, how it changes you know the the velocity in the basement in the basin is lower than than it is in the shallow base basement out here okay. So uh, you know we have a, <clears throat> a lower velocity direct wave, but then um, that is uh, when that direct wave uh, it's not being outrun by a refraction necessarily here. The direct wave is basically hitting this wall, of the basin, and the velocity is faster. And so there's the uh, propagation in that faster velocity. And if you can see it, um, yeah, you can almost see it on the screen. There's a little bit of a diffraction here. You know, which is a sign that 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 little bit of curvature in the uh, uh, in the refraction times is telling you that there you know you're seeing a, a fault, a, a change in velocity. Okay, but there's all this other stuff going on too. You can see that the direct wave itself reflects off the side of the fault and back into the basin, and then there's some diffraction down here, which must come from the like the far. Um, uh, wall of the basin, okay, or or the far corner of the basin at depth, and that's you know that's a forward diffraction to the left, but then it's a it's a it's a uh, a back reflection or a, a it's it's reverse scattering back scattering I'm sorry, uh, forward scattering to the left, back scattering to the right, and you can see that they change phase right at the uh, these diffractions change phase right at the um, uh, at the apex of the hyperbola, um, which so it's holding to physics there. Um, let's see. Uh, here are some hyperbolic reflections from, uh, or not quite hyperbolic reflections from these interfaces down here. Right, they're all there, okay, um, but they're they're not hyperbolas in the sense that we wanted. Right, they're they're not flat at zero offset, okay. So all we do is we throw in a little lateral heterogeneity, and we've, you know, our nice interpretable record section is all screwed up now. Okay. So. Okay. And uh, just, just, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Yeah, I'm not sure how to make it to scroll continuously, but um, 
So uh, here I'm comparing this this synthetic, especially across its um, its more uh, uh, heterogeneous parts. I'm comparing the synthetic with the um, um, with the real data above. Okay, so up above we got we got the recorded data, and below we got the synthetic. Uh, how do I know that that that's the case? Uh, the synthetic is zero before the the first arrival, and of course the real data are anything but zero before the first arrival. Okay, at these ten kilometer offsets, it's it's sometimes it's very hard to see the uh, the first arrival. Okay, so there's this uh, diffraction. Um, <clears throat> There's uh, you know there's these kinks at the uh, the southwest branch of the fault and then the deeper diffractions from the fault, um, you know here we're uh, from from left to right where the survey is progressing from south to north and so it's getting further and further into the basin. Uh, these near uh, near offset right look at the the zero offset trace here or the near offset trace, you know it's it's almost completely crap. I mean you can't. I don't know that I can follow any reflections uh, into the uh, the zero offset trace on any of these records. I can see some of the um, direct waves on the zero offset trace, but that's about it. Okay, there's just too much source generated noise uh, near the uh, near the vibrators on the surface. Okay, so we really here here's a case. Not only not only do we um, um, do we need more than one trace? Okay, we really need a whole bunch of them just to be able to see anything. Okay, because the noise level is pretty high, uh, and it's also helping us figure out this wildly complex topography here, or, or wildly complex geometry here. Uh, you know, it's a relatively simple model, just a sort of a square basin and cross section, and it's producing all these phases that we, you know, we got to figure out where do they come from. You know. Um, they may be surface multiples. They may be multiples from within the basin. And here's a, a view, uh, a piece of analysis I did a long time ago to to try to figure that out. Okay. Um, so I've taken all 50 synthetic records, all right, and I've just stacked them up into a data cube. And uh, I, I don't know if you can do similar things like this to uh, in Open Detect, you know, with the pre. This is pre-stacked data, okay, and um, so the the data cube has uh, axis. You know, time is still pointing down. Okay, offset. Uh, you can see I've arranged it so that offset points to the right. So that's the opposite the sense in the in the in the previous uh, page. You know, here offset pointed to the left, uh, and here offset pointed to the left. Now I, I'm looking at a mirror image of that. Offsets pointing to the right. Um, and then uh, what you know each each slice of this on this right hand this this front right hand face each slice you know goes goes back to a different source location. Now, if you look at the left hand front face, what are you seeing? You're seeing essentially the near offset uh, traces, and then I've made the 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 volume partly transparent. You know any anything that's near zero is transparent. So um, you can actually trace, you know, from one place to another. You know, how do I, how do I know that that, you know, this here in the record is from the basin bottom, you know, cutting at an angle through this diffraction, because it connects up through the volume to the basin bottom reflection on this zero offset face. Okay. So so what's on the left front face is what we would get in a chirp survey, if we could do a chirp survey. Of course. You know, looking at the data, right? Um, you know, the 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 left front face would be all these you know very noisy traces, and we would not be able to see anything in it. Okay, so um, that uh, uh, this this data volume turns out to be a really powerful tool to figure out where where things come from. So so you know we're going to work on on. Um, how how do we process this left front face here, the zero offset data? How are you, how do we process that to get everything in the right place? And that actually is, uh, and that's what we're going to do. Really, the rest of this, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, really the rest of this uh, 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 class. Uh, that's also going to give us some hints about how do we process 
the non-zero offset data, okay, and get that in the correct place? How do we have that contribute to our image of the? You know, here's the 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 uh, the east branch reflection. That's the north wall of the basin. Here's some diffractions in the zero offset uh, part. Uh, uh, from the uh, the southwest branch, you know the the south wall of the basin. Okay, so that everything's uh, everything's in there, and now we can see the connections between, um, you know, into the rest of the volume. Okay, with this kind of this kind of view, I, I, eventually uh, I'll see if I can get this kind of uh, view in in Open Detect, because I, I I need to. Uh, this is this makes it so much easier to understand where things are coming from. You know, because here we can, you know, in the zero offset plane, we can tie things to certain structures, as I've as I've labeled here, and um, uh, and we can follow them into the uh, into the non-zero offset part. Okay, so I guess I'll have to uh, uh, finish the story um, tomorrow at eleven. We're in notes number thirteen, and I've been demonstrating to you the effect of lateral heterogeneities on seismic reflection surveys. So we have here a comparison between the CoCorp California Line 5 or Mojave Line 5 data set um, on the top with uh, a simple acoustic synthetic. But the acoustic synthetic does include multiple reflections and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and so we put the, uh, you know, we, we, I did put the data together into a volume. Uh, and it's uh, you know quite difficult to see anything, especially uh, in this front left um, face, which would be the zero offset or near offset section. Um, but putting the uh, the synthetics together uh, into that uh, volume does demonstrate uh, what you can do by uh, identifying diffractions and reflections in the um, in the zero offset section, and then carrying them through the volume to identify what's going on in multi offset. Um, and uh, now uh, I'm going to show you what happens um, when you process such data in the typical, you know, old line industry way. So, you know, let me uh, break out a bunch of these uh, sections that are in the they're uh, multi-offset sections, so they're you know one of these sections is this section on the uh, front uh, right side, and uh, in fact that would be let's see if I get this right um, that would be the most heterogeneous section, so it would be this this one at the upper right, and then as the survey um, and, and uh, so that's the northernmost section, which actually is the very last record in the in the in the data set. Um, the southernmost record in this little piece of the data set, uh, at least in the synthetic, is uh, this one on the lower left, which is the most homogeneous record. And then the ones the records in between are uh, uh, at at intermediate positions, you know, where they're like half on the heterogeneous part, like this one here. Half on the heterogeneous, well, maybe a quarter on the heterogeneous part, and three quarters, uh, you can't see it, but three quarters on the homogeneous part. And these, uh, these you know, weird phases are coming through. If you're looking for um, <clears throat> typical uh, normal move out high reflection hyperbolas that would get uh, flattened out by some kind of uh, NMO and stacking uh, procedure, uh, which is the typical processing sequence, and even for you know our very advanced data sets. Um, uh, we often uh, go through that 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 you know standard. Um, I mean, it's processing that was invented 35, 40 years ago. We go through that first, maybe in the field, just to see, you know, get some indication of what we have, and we know that it's only it's essentially only going to give us part of the data set, and, and here's why. So so there's this hyperboloid here, which is too steep. It's not flat at zero offset, which is on the right side of each section. Uh, down here, we're starting to see a flat hyperbola. And here's a pretty good one, OK, among all the other phases, uh, many of which are more are stronger. Here's a, still a pretty good hyperbola. And, uh, and there's one there. Um, 
you see plenty of hyperbolas in the homogeneous one, uh, and you don't see this one here from the bottom of the basin because you know when we're not over the basin, we can't see the bottom of the basin, or at least it's much more difficult. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to take the next step in this uh, NMO um, correction process, and I'm going to flatten the hyperbolas. Okay, through um, you know just standard NMO uh, correction. Okay, so. <clears throat> what that does is, is uh, you know, it requires me to have made a, a guess at the velocity that that creates this hyperbola. Basically, guess at the velocity that these little scraps of hyperbolas are uh, are asymptotic to. You know, when we're deep in the basin here, and we have like this hyperbola is obviously asymptotic to the first arrival. So the um, the the first arrival is uh, is a pretty good um, the first arrival becomes a, a uh, you know, which we can guess at the velocity for that, and it's fairly low, um, is a is a pretty good uh, uh, indicator there. Uh, notice uh, that's part of the heterogene heterogeneity, right? And you can see it right here when uh, when we pass out of the basin to the south and into the uh, the bedrock area to the south, you can see that the first arrival bends and becomes flatter. So the you know that's just the uh, the higher velocities at the surface um, showing up. At the uh, uh, you know, outside the basin, and you can see that the hyperbolas are all asymptotic to that higher velocity. All right, so um, we do the correction, and you know the annoying thing here is that most of the energy in each section is like bent up into these uh, smiling, um, you know, U shapes. They're they're completely you know their coherency is completely destroyed. By the um, um, by, the NMO correction because you know they're not asymptotic to the correct velocity. Okay, there's just this one reflection here that has uh, the the correct asymptotic velocity, and so this is the same one I was pointing to in the last one. It was the hyperbola. Now it's it's not perfectly corrected, but it's it's corrected. Okay, and it's almost flat. That's what we're looking for with the NMO correction. You know, it should be almost flat. Uh, you can see that the homogeneous section, which is to the south, you know, since the velocity is too low, it's it's completely overcorrected, right? So as soon as we as soon as we cross over one of those lateral boundaries, right, the data aren't being corrected well at all. So really, nothing is going to stack in, uh, even though those those boundaries are nice and flat. Nothing's going to stack in outside the the basin. You know, really, we're only going to see the basin bottom, right? That's the only thing that's flat. Now, just, just in case you don't know what stacking does, right? This is the NMO correction step. What stacking does then is it um, uh, it sums each of these data sections horizontally. So you take this you know two D picture here, and it gets summed horizontally, you know basically into the zero offset trace. And um, so you know what's going to happen with that? Like up here, right? We're summing horizontally. We're summing positive, you know, mild positive with a little bit negative, with strong positive. I'm sorry, uh, with strong negative, with strong positive, with mild negative, with mild positive. You know, you 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 have a summation path horizontally across here. And it's pretty much gonna gonna average out to zero, okay? But you have a, a summation path that's horizontal along one of these, fl you know, correctly flattened hyperbolas, you know, which you can see are quite few. Right, and we're going to have you know strong negative, strong negative, strong negative, strong negative. That's all going to get summed into the into the uh, zero offset trace. So we'll get that reflection will appear, okay. Uh, after uh, after stacking, okay. Um, but you can see that that everything else, all the other reflections, even the ones you know, there's still this is still the reflection from the basin bottom, or just below the basin bottom, you know, you know and it is a nice hyperbola, but because of the lateral heterogeneity, you know it's not it's not stacking flat, okay, and uh, um, and it won't sum. So here's that here's that stack. You've you've seen this this before. So really, if I if I like make all the sums right along the right edge of each of each uh, um, of each section, I will get a trace, and I put all those traces together into a cross section into an image. Which I call the stack, okay, 
and uh, the CV stack means I just use a constant NMO correction velocity throughout. You know, we can do a little bit better than that, but still, the fact remains that no matter what we do, um, you know, if we go across uh, these lateral heterogeneities, you know, we're just not going to be able to get it flat all the way across. It just doesn't work. Okay, so here we see, you know, the range over which we can get that flat base and bottom summed in, and that's that's where the the most of the survey was right above it. Okay, so uh, you know that's uh, remember the the front left side of that volume of the of the records was this <clears throat> you know ideal zero offset section, and that's what we get from from marine surveys. You know, so we can we don't have to approximate it with a stack um, uh, uh, like we do on land, but uh, you know on land. The zero offset section is uh, is just totally garbage, so uh, <clears throat> we have no uh, no way of uh, of getting past that. And uh, so we can, the only thing we can do is make a stack, and you can see that the stack represents some of the more prominent features of the uh, um, of the zero offset section. In particular, um, what you can see is that. The the stack uh, is kind of a um, it's kind of a a, a, a a dip filter. It favors things that don't have any dip. If they have any dip, they're they're much weaker. You know, like here's the uh, the reflection from the 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 ramp on the uh, on the north side of the of the basin. Okay, and it's much weaker in the stack than it is in the zero offset section. You know, and also these diffractions. I mean, a diffraction, you know, a diffracting point, a ball bearing, you know, buried in the ground. That's that's essentially a, uh, you know, uh, an in, uh, uh, that's essentially got a ninety degree dip. You know, it's or or all dips if you like, and you know, there's a much weaker diffraction recovered from the uh, uh, the ball bearing, which is the end. You know, the the chopped off end of the uh, <clears throat> uh, end of the um, uh, base and bottom reflection. Okay, so uh, you know we don't recover any hyperbolas very well, and um, uh, and really what we're emphasizing completely is the uh, anything that's flat, and even things that are flat that are underneath, um, you know they might be emphasized, but uh, um, it's it's still difficult. Okay, they're not coming out very well. Because there's just too much interference from the laterally heterogeneous velocities, so so um, you know one of the things we're going to learn to do straight straight away is to migrate this stack. You know this 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 diffraction is here. This bow tie actually is because like right at this point here, right at the intersection of the bow tie, well, there's really three reflections. Okay, that there's you know the basin bottom reflection has a depth point, a reflection point. Which is, in fact, because the base and bottom is flat, right under the midpoint there. Okay. Now this uh, diffraction, right? Uh, uh, that that comes from the reflection from the tilted base and bottom, uh, the tilted base and edge, right? Which should be over here. Um, let me go back up to the model. Okay. So. Here's the sharp, you know, near vertical basin uh, edge on the south side of the basin. Here's the the 45 degree dipping basin edge on the north side of the basin. All right. So the, um, um, you know, this this point in the bow tie at the intersection of all these bow ties, right, is. Um, uh, its midpoint, the midpoint of the source and receiver that show that best, you know, is the same is the same point. But where is the reflection point? The reflection point is not uh, is not at that midpoint. The reflection point is up here somewhere. Remember, you you dip it, you dip the the reflector, and the uh, the reflection point climbs up the dip. Okay. Um, so okay, you're going to learn how to do. And, and all the physics behind the migration, which is going to take this uh, this diffraction, this point right here in this uh, in this diffraction hyperbola, uh, much much of which is missing, 
And it's, we're going to migrate it up dip to where it belongs, which is going to be somewhere in here. Okay, and here's the migration accomplished on the upper right. You know, it's and it's put things more in their correct place. Okay, um, let's see now. Uh, there's also at this bow tie right. There's this point which uh, is uh, in this diffraction from the south edge of the basin bottom, and we migrate that. And maybe it's easiest to look at it from the zero offset data in its migration, right? That should migrate a migration. Another thing that it does, besides moving the reflection points up dip properly into their true positions, the other thing it does is it collapses diffractions because, you know, this uh, this diffraction it's it's a reflection. It's a it's backscattering, right? And it's being put here under this midpoint, but it's really coming from this point right here. It's coming from the left edge of the basin bottom. Okay, the south edge of the basin bottom. So that's going to migrate up the diffraction and appear, and, it, and the whole diffraction is going to be migrated and concentrated at its apex. Okay, and here it is. You can see it's not it's not perfect, but uh, it's pretty close. You know, within a wavelength, all of that energy, all that diffraction energy, is put into this one point, at least within one wavelength of one point. Um, so that's the other thing it does. And so, okay, here we got this partial diffraction, and we, it's going to get you know, collapse into its apex, which is right in here. But you know, you can see because we don't have the whole diffraction, right? Instead of having all this, we just got these scraps here. It, it doesn't reconstruct perfectly, and we got artifacts. These smiling artifacts are are migration artifacts. Um, you know, of course, if we'd had uh, you know really nice, clean zero offset data to begin with, we could get this far. But on land, we never do. So. So we start with you know what we want is this, okay, and what we the best we can get after this class, okay. Sorry, I can only take you so far in one class. All right, the best we can get after this class is this. So at least right in the you know the the this crucial intersection here uh, between these two structures, the north wall of the basin and the bottom of the basin, that intersection maybe that's a, a really crucial uh, uh, part to our geologic story, okay. We pretty much got that. The relative geometry, we've got it. All right, so that's what we're after with, with migration. And we're going to learn how to do migrations from zero offset data. And if we have clean, um, if we have nice clean uh, uh, zero offset data like, like uh, Amy Isis's chirp survey, we get a great result okay, with what you learn in this class. If we have the, the, the crappy data that uh, that I record on land, um, you know, we we can only get so far, okay. But what we're able to get is that crucial geometric relationship. All right, at least we got that correct. the The amplitude, the strength of these reflections, I mean, that's all munge now. You know, the the flat basin bottom is totally overemphasized, okay. And we and we don't have enough amplitude left from the the dipping reflector to to really trace it anywhere near the surface. But at least at the intersection, we can we can get the correct geometric relation. Okay, and what did I you know? So what did I really do with that data? Okay, uh, this is a uh, you know as I as I talk, I'll hint at it uh, several times more in uh, um, uh, in in this class. But in seven fifty seven, you know, I I go into how exactly you. You go about uh, doing that pre-stack migration and how you do it uh, through um, this, uh, uh, you know, through such a complex velocity model. It turns out to be uh, really uh, uh, not a, uh, it's not an amazingly complicated procedure. And so I take the real data, you know, the real noisy data, and I can actually image. Uh, Satish and I achieved imaging of of the. The bottom part of that uh, 45 degree dipping um, east branch of the Garlock Fault, uh, north side of the basin. Uh, as you can see, we did, we we don't have much evidence for that sharp. Uh, you know, in the reflections, we don't we can't we're not getting a very good image of the uh, of the steeply dipping southwest branch at the south end of the basin um, in the reflection data. Uh, where we see that is is really in our velocity inversions. And uh, Satish has a has a GRL paper uh, about that uh, that uses this data set and and combines the uh, 
uh, reflection travel times and a coherency measure on the pre-stack reflections in the process of the velocity modeling. Um, so I and and he got an even better result than this. Um, GRL paper probably from ninety five or no ninety four ninety five. So uh, um, and actually, it's too bad that paper hasn't been cited very much uh, because uh, it uh, it really pointed the way towards a lot of the the developments that we've been able to to make since. All right, um, I left these in here because these are uh, these are actually. 35 millimeter slides that I could show uh, to uh, to illustrate the um, uh, to illustrate uh, 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 seismic imaging, but uh, I'm not going to show 35 millimeter slides anymore. But you, uh, I do want to preserve the list of the examples that I was showing. 